So, can we please have a very warm Glasgow Skeptics welcome for Vance Crow? The, uh, the genesis of that hunky Monsanto thing is a reporter that was actually making fun of me, and it has turned into this like constant thing that skeptics always bring up. I, I can't imagine a more awkward way to be introduced. But um, today, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I call crossing over the mountain. And as I was introduced before, my name is Vance Crow, and I am the curiously titled Director of Millennial Engagement. And uh, when we think about this crossing over the mountain, I'm going to describe the distance that um, many people that are in agriculture feel that they are from people living in the cities. And oftentimes, I, and you'll see in a little bit, I'll describe this in uh, gigantic terms, uh, very hyperbolic in terms of just how far away people are from where their food is grown. And, uh, I, I always thought that was the largest mountain that anybody could climb over until uh, Callum um, asked me, hey, would you ever think about doing a Skeptics in the Pub tour over here in the UK? And I realized that what he was actually asking me to do was to go to my bosses at a Fortune 500 company and say, hey guys, I got an idea. I'm going to go on a pub crawl throughout the UK <laughs> and, uh, and talk over beers about, about our company. And, uh, and that was a big mountain to cr climb over. So I actually have to say thank you to you guys here because it took months. Uh, you would say like, hey, are you thinking about this date? And I'd be like, oh, it's, I'm, it's still in committee and you still need to ask people. So um, I want to thank you. I, this was not easy for them to put together, mostly because I was asking to go on a pub tour for my company. And I think that brings me to the fact that never in my wildest dreams ever did I imagine that I would be here standing in front of you today. And in particular, I never imagined that I would be the director of millennial engagement. And if you're like me, when I heard that title, I wondered, what, what does that mean? Like, what are they, are they trying to hire somebody that they think will just go out and uh, talk to young people and wear skinny jeans and go to concerts? Like, what is that concept? And I think that it's kind of important to describe why we have a director of millennial engagement. And it's because for many years, Monsanto viewed itself as a company that sells things to farmers. We sell seeds and technology, uh, whether that's data, or we make genetically engineered crops, we also breed for vegetables. So we thought we have relationships with farmers and we do that really well. Uh, one of the reasons that we're a leader is that we have highly developed relationships with our customers. We really know and trust one another. And then all the way over here on the other pole, we're a publicly traded company. So we have relationships with our investors, people from uh, all over the world that invest in our company expecting a return. And I think it surprises a lot of people that are far away from Wall Street, I know it surprised me, is that we are actually considered one of the gold standard of Wall Street because of our transparency. When we go to the investors and we say, hey, we have a new technology, we think it's going to do this, uh, they believe us. And when we come back and say, hey, that one didn't work out as well, they also believe us. So we had focused and become uh, a world leader in agriculture by focusing on these two poles right here. But what we missed, because Monsanto does not sell anything at all to consumers, literally nothing we did not consider that in between these two poles are literally billions of people. Because when we were developing these technologies, we thought as long as we talk to these people here and these people here, it's gonna be fine. The farmers will go out and talk with the public, the academics that are helping us establish some of this technology, they'll get out there. But we didn't, we ourselves did not go get in that conversation and we see now what happens if you don't enter that conversation. It is that those conversations go on without you. And so uh, after many, uh, many years of kind of staying out of it, not allowing documentarians to come into our company, uh, not answering things because we saw the information that was coming out on places like Natural News, and we said, if we respond to these wild accusations, it's only going to validate them. It's only going to make them seem more credible. And what we realized was there were people that were out there looking for answers, and we weren't there at all. So the company about two and a half years ago made the big decision that what they were going to do was that they were going to reorganize the entire communications department. And even though there was going to be no immediate return on investment because we aren't going to sell anything to consumers, 
we're gonna get out and start talking with consumers. And in addition to doing things like starting up a social media program and answering people's questions on the website or on Facebook, they also decided that we needed to have someone go out and talk with the public. And so my work is really to figure out where is it that we should go to talk with people? And when we think about millennial engagement, what does that word mean? Well, really we should, I think of it in terms of the reason you name a generation, the reason that word does work is because it represents that there are new ideas that are building out in the ocean that are about to crash onto the shore of society. And when that crashes onto the shore of society, it won't become society, but it just represents that society's about to change. And so when we think of millennials, we don't actually care at all how old people are. What we care about is who is at the top of that wave. Who are the people that are making ideas diffuse into society? And that's you. That's how I could make the case that Monsanto should come and speak at a Skeptics in the Pub event in Glasgow. Because if there are any people out in the world that we want to talk with, it's the people that are going to say, I'm going to ask you a question, and if you give me a reasonable answer, we're going to be okay. I may not agree with it, but I'm going to accept it. And I think that that's a testament to this group of people here that, you, that, that you're, you're creating this movement within the world. You are being recognized, and people are seeing that it's valuable to be here. I personally know about the skeptics, and it, I, Brian had mentioned him before, because when I came to interview at Monsanto, I actually had no intention of taking the job whatsoever. I had come to Monsanto because I had been searching as long and as hard as I could for how can I make the biggest difference in the world. And I was looking around for who would hire me to do these things. So I became a deckhand on a ship that was traveling around and seeing whales or visiting the indigenous people in Panama. Or I joined the US Peace Corps where you go to volunteer your time. I was trying to prevent malaria in a small village that had never seen it before. And, uh, and then I'd gone on to work at, at an NPR affiliate station in the World Bank. I had been searching for as long as I could to find what will make the biggest difference in the world. And you know, I'm sure as many of you, as you go through your lives, you have these experiences that point you, maybe make you a little bit more directed in what you want to do. And when I was in the Peace Corps, I was teaching people how to prevent malaria, which is really complicated. Because if you want to teach somebody that doesn't have access to medicines to be able to prevent it, then what you have to teach them is how to keep their children covered up at night, or how to pour vegetable oil into, into puddles so that mosquito larvae will die, or how to treat bed nets. And while I was there doing this work, one day, after I'd been there for months, thinking I was doing a great job of teaching the science, a man walked into town, and he had a suit on, and he was carrying this beautiful box, and he set it on the, uh, down in the middle of town, and he stepped up on top of it, and he sold every single person in that village a vial of water that he had convinced them by telling this great story. If he had only had this vial of water, it would have kept him from getting malaria. And it was then in my life that I realized, hey, wait a second, the science isn't enough. You have to make your ideas competitive. And so after I left the Peace Corps, when I got the chance to come and interview at Monsanto, a job I didn't want at all, then I, I saw this opportunity. And when I say I didn't want the job at all, this is um, maybe a bit of an understatement. I was not at that point in my life worried about GMOs. I had kind of heard about them um, or, or organic. But I had heard of all of the dark things that people had said about Monsanto. So when I saw they were applying for this job, I apply, when, they were, when they were accepting applications for this job, I applied for it. And my whole reason for applying for it is because who doesn't want to see inside of Mordor, right? <laughs> In my mind, I was imagining that I was going, if I got the job interview, that I would go up to a building that would be 80 stories tall with giant clouds billowing around it and thunder and lightning. And when I went there and I discovered that actually the person greeting me at the door wasn't wearing a black suit with uh, Matrix-style sunglasses. They were actually wearing a sweater and a ponytail, and they said, come on in, let's have an interview. And I go through this interview, and, and maybe some of you have had the experience of interviewing for a job you don't want. You just say whatever you think. And I'm saying, you need to just go out there constantly. You need to be out answering people's questions. Their questions aren't wrong. It's that you need to be answering them. And we get all the way to the end of the interview, and the woman interviewing me says, okay, 
do you have any questions for me? And I said, yeah, I got a question for you. How are you going to train this director of millennial engagement if it's a totally new job? And she said, well, whoever we hire for this job, I will, uh, I'll set up a training program specifically for them. But for you, what I'll do, because you've been so curious throughout the day, I would write up a list of 50 people from throughout the company. Chemists, biologists, geneticists, attorneys, communications people, farmers, and I would have you go talk with them. And after you get done with that list of 50 people, you'll sit down and I'll ask you questions about agriculture. And whatever you don't know, we'll line up another list of 50 people, and we'll just have you do that. I'm now on my ninth list of 50 people. I do it all the time. But in that moment, I realized this is literally the greatest opportunity of my life. Because if what they are saying, when I get to go interview these people, I discover that, uh, the, that this company is as evil as everyone thinks that it is, then I'm going to get to leave this company and go write the greatest tell-all book of all time. And if it's not, well, then you've discovered an enormous problem. A company and technology that is being deeply misrepresented, and because of that, people all over the world are trying to make the right decisions, and they're making them because this group of people couldn't make the science outcompete the man on the box. So then I went home and I had to figure out how in the world am I going to tell my wife that this morning the job that I was going to interview for that I didn't want, that now I want it. I did what all good millennials do. I got on YouTube. And I found this crazy character who I had never seen before. And this, in, in, in looking up his videos, you can't quite see it here. This is the bad science in the paper of the long-term toxicity of the Roundup herbicide. And he goes in, and if you've never seen this video, it's excellent, and Miles looks much younger and less haggard in this uh, video than he does now. But uh, it was excellent, and it, was, it showed me the power of skepticism. Because he had put this video up, and he had said, hey, these are the things that you should know, and these are the papers, and these are interviews that I've done with people that are doing March Against Monsanto. And he explained it for me in a way that I could take with my wife, to show my wife, and I could know confidently it's okay for me to go inside of the company and find out if they are who they say they are. So now maybe we'll transition and talk a little bit about the shape of the problem. And maybe to get a little bit of a scope of the room, um, because I, I was reading some of the event comments and it's very clear I'm a communications person, not a scientist. In fact, my background is diplomacy, not, not uh, biology or chemistry, but I know that there are people in here that are in the sciences. So do we have some chemists in the room? Any chemists? Okay, biologists? Geneticists? Okay, farmers? Okay, one farmer, all right. So I, what I thought that I would do is during the first 45 minutes or this part of the conversation, I would try and make it so we're all on the same plane so that we all have kind of the same understanding of the problems facing agriculture and some of the different tools used to solve them. And that way when we take the break and we come back, when we have questions, and you can ask me anything you want to talk about, whether it's the business of Monsanto or GMOs or other parts about plants, we at least have the same basis. And I'm expecting that there will be people in the room that have a deeper knowledge in any one of these specific areas than I do. So my hope is I can just represent maybe a, a starting off point for all of us. So the shape of the problem. This is a graphic of the population over the last 10,000 years. And 10,000 years is an interesting marking point because if we think about human beings in the longer term, the way longer term, for over 2 million years, human beings spent 80% of their energy, their waking lives, searching for food. And when we think about the, the, what it would be like to be a hunter and a gatherer, I think it's important to really articulate what this meant. It meant that this was a time before you had very many tools. So you could maybe club a small animal or you could come across one that had died from some other purposes. You could pick berries off of trees and put them in your mouth. And if they were sweet, you would swallow them. And if they were bitter, you would spit them out before they poisoned you. 
Or when things got very rough, you would dig in the ground with rocks or even your fingers looking for roots that you could brush the dirt off of and gnaw on. That was human existence for over 2 million years until about 10,000 years ago. It's about 10 or 12,000, depending on who you ask, when all of a sudden there were groups of people all over the world almost at the exact same time that figured out, hey, wait a second, if instead of eating all the berries or all of the grains that I found on that grass that I could eat, if instead of eating them right away, I take them and I put them in the ground and I protect them from everything else that wants to steal from them, that wants to steal their sunlight, that wants to steal their water, their nutrients, then I can eventually grow up more calories than I needed to put into to be able to raise those crops. And so suddenly, once you have this invention of agriculture, everything else about civilization becomes possible. Suddenly now, some people can be producing food, and other people can be making pottery, or weapons, or breeding for uh, better crops, or even building roads. Before you have 10,000 years, you don't even have cities or written language. All of those things happen after agriculture occurs. And you can see this building, and if, the, if there was more space, you could see that this is its linear growth for quite a long time, and then around 1000 AD, we see this explosion of human population, which is possible because most people don't have to spend most of their lives searching for food. Now, in the last 100 years, this has had some very serious ramifications. You see, in this graph, this is the US workforce in agriculture since the 1900s. And you can actually go, I, I looked it up for Scotland, the, it was a little bit harder to find this data because it was happening over the 1800s, 1700s, 1800s. But just as a show of, of uh, how this transition has happened, this graph right here is showing that in 1900s, 42% of the US population lived and worked on farms. By 2000, that number had grown to be less than 2% of the population. So it's one thing to watch this graph go down, but it's another to recognize what it actually means. This graphic right here represents the largest migration of human beings in the history of time. More has changed since the 1900s all over the world by people that used to spend most of their time in the dirt protecting those crops that they were growing. They picked themselves up, they dust themselves off, and they walked into the city to find other work. And that, as they moved into the city, you can think of that as metaphorical dirt dropping on the ground and building up a giant mountain between the people that were living in the city and the people that are now living on farms. This has had quite an impact because when I go to college campuses all over the United States, I can show photos like these, and while people can say insect, not very clean crops, it looks like that leaf is browning and drought, they don't have a deep understanding of the level of sophistication that these problems are for farmers. And so what this has often caused is this divide where people that are living in the city, they have an imagination of the problems that farmers are trying to face out in the countryside but no real deep understanding, and you can't blame them. I don't know very much about energy or where my water comes from, right? They're just going on with their daily lives, but these problems are deeply embedded into what's going on with them. And so I'm gonna come back to these problems in just a little bit, but to set maybe a little bit of a context for everyone, I wanna talk about the different ways that, that, um, that we interact with plants. And the first one is plant domestication. So I was unaware before I came to Monsanto that a crop like broccoli did not occur in the wild. There was no such thing as wild broccoli that you could go out and find. What you could find was along riverbanks, there would be this tall, spindly plant that would grow up. And now we call it Brassica olerica. But it had these, uh, these very rough, tough, green leaves on the side, and it had these little lateral buds growing up on the stem, and it had little bushy seed pods just down at the bottom. 
And it turns out that if you took, if you were going around and instead of just eating that plant, Brassica olerica plant, it's a wild mustard or wild cabbage. It was a really fantastic plant because you could eat almost all of it. But when, like, just like we talked about before, if somebody, instead of eating the entire plant, they said, hey, that one with the bushiest seed pods, let's not eat that. Let's just put it in the ground. Let's grow that. And if every time you grow up those seeds, you select for one particular trait, or maybe two, bushy seed pods, and you do that a few thousand times, you no longer have wild cabbage or wild mustard. You now have broccoli. Because those bushy seed pods are so overexpressed that now you have this totally different plant. And the interesting thing about this Brassica olerica is that not only did, is that where we got broccoli, but it's also where we got kale, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi. There are many, many things that came just from that one plant, and that is domestication. It's selecting for certain properties. The next uh, concept that's deeply important within vegetables or really all of, of uh, agriculture is the concept of breeding. So we know just like we can take two dogs that have traits that we, we want and we can have them breed out to have those traits, uh, we can do this with things like tomatoes. So one of the things, and I'm not sure if this is common in the United States, but people often complain about the, the, the tomatoes in the United States don't have that great taste. They only do if you have these heirloom tomatoes or if you have these ones that are a little bit different. And I don't, even, I don't think people are wrong about that. In many ways, they are correct. And it's because for a long time, for about 25 years, companies that were breeding out vegetable seeds like tomatoes were selecting for a new trait. They were trying to breed a trait that we maybe don't think too much about, which is the peel, the skin of that tomato needed to be strong enough that you could put it in the bottom of a truck and pile 10,000 pounds of tomatoes on top of it, and it wouldn't crush, right? So they started select, they started breeding so that you would have stronger and stronger tomato peels. But we can take these traits and we can start saying, but what if I wanna have a sweeter tomato? What if I wanna have one that is, instead of being squishy, is maybe a little bit tougher or has a different kind of chewing sensation? At a place like Monsanto, we spend about 50% of our R&D budget on breeding. So we're trying to figure out, we have people that are cutting open tomatoes to see how do they cut, how do they taste, and can we choose two parents and breed them together just through natural pollination and have the best uh, types come out from that. That's breeding. There's another concept called mutagenesis. And mutagenesis is not often talked about, but is actually a very interesting technique to be able to get variation or traits into these plants that you maybe want. We talked about tougher skin or sweeter flavor. Well, with mutagenesis, oftentimes breeders could say, we want some new traits, but we can't find any other parents that have the traits that we want. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a pile of these seeds and we're going to uh, expose them to some form of radiation. And that radiation could be chemical or it could be nuclear. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. And then what you do is you take those seeds and you put them in the ground and you plant them and you let them grow up, something like a grapefruit, for example. And then you see, do any of these grapefruit trees produce fruits that I like? And one time, actually not that long ago, I think about 45 years ago, somebody cut one open that had gone through mutagenesis and it had this bright red flesh in it. And it's now known as the ruby red tomato, or uh, the ruby red grapefruit. It was so loved and so accepted by people because they were able to say we loved it, it had all these traits that we liked, that it is now the state fruit of the state of Texas. So it's, a, it's been completely accepted. And what, the way that they created it was by bombarding the genome and having all of these changes happen. They didn't know exactly what happened, but they liked the fruit that came from it. The next context is genetic engineering. Now this is the concept where you say you take a trait from one organism or a, or a gene from one organism and you place it into the genome of another plant. So for example, if you have cotton and you have the Bacillus thuringiensis uh, bacteria, you can take a part of it and you can put it into the cotton. 
and it will allow the cotton to resist insects. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It is far more precise than something like mutagenesis, where you're just trying to make changes happen in that genome. And yet, when you do a genetic engineer, genetic engineering, um, what you're actually doing is you're trying experiments to see did it place in the right place that we wanted. So you have to grow out a whole bunch of plants and see which ones did the gene enter in the right place, and then you get rid of the rest of them. Now, one thing you may notice is I'm calling this genetic engineering, and up there I have the term GMO. This is an important concept, uh, I think, maybe for how people did outreach or how the industry and academics thought about outreach. When people are talking about GMOs, genetically modified organisms, they're talking about genetic engineering. But for a very long time, when that term came out, genetically modified organisms and GMOs, the companies that had the scientists that were inventing these technologies, like Monsanto, and the academic institutions, all universities all over the country, really all over the world, were saying, don't use that term. It's not precise. What we're doing is transgenics. What we're doing is genetic engineering. And so they actively made sure that in nowhere that, that they were putting out information did it ever say the word GMO or genetic modification. I can't say that it's everywhere, but for the most part, if you go look at any of our publications, they didn't have that term in there. And the reason is because they thought, well, it's not precise enough. But the, the effect of that decision to not name genetic engineering or respond to what the public was talking about is that people that were creating all of the memes about GMOs by putting syringes in them or putting fangs on them or saying that they do all these terrible things, they, when they were putting this information out online, there was nothing to respond to it because all of the industry and academia's response was written about genetic engineering or transgenics, and nobody was searching for that. So it was an interesting lesson that now as we talk about new technologies, ones that are even further out on the edge, we're trying to figure out how do you balance between being precise and writing out what it is that you're actually doing, which brings me to gene editing. So maybe many of you in here have heard of technologies like CRISPR-Cas9, where, where what you're doing is you're able to um, basically take a virus, the, some of the properties of a virus, and know very precisely where you're putting a gene in, or you can knock a gene out. So for example, uh, there are mushrooms now that brown when they're cut open, and they figured out by using this very special gene editing technique, you could go and knock one of the genes out of the genome that, that made it brown, that made it less valuable, so when you cut it, you have to get it to the store faster so it lasts longer and there's less food waste. That would be considered gene editing only because of the style of which you're doing it. And it's different than genetic engineering because you don't necessarily need to be taking it from one organism and putting it in another. So now we'll go back to some of these problems that we talked about before. <coughs> Up in that corner, that's the corn rootworm. This causes a huge amount of damage <clears throat> in the United States because what it does is it bores into the roots of corn and then it lays larvae. Those larvae grow up to be moths and they chew away at the, at the actual corn cob. Now, if we weren't just talking about the corn borer, uh, we could be talking about any insect. There are only a few options that farmers have to be able to get rid of this insect, right? Before you have chemistry, what people end up doing is they literally send people, uh, like when I was in Kenya, when they didn't have access to chemicals, they would send children out into the fields and they would literally be picking the insects up and squishing them and putting them in a bag in order to be able to get rid of them. That's in a very rare circumstance because even in many places in, in places like Kenya, they have access to chemistry. And so another option that you could have for insects is insecticides. You could have a chemical that is either broad spectrum, it kills all of the insects that it comes in contact with, or it could be hyper-specific. There's uh, one chemical that is used, it's actually, I, I mentioned it earlier, called BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. This is one that is used in, all, in, in both organic and conventional agriculture. It's a sort of bacterium that you can grow up and you can put it into a powder form and go spread it out onto your fields. And in its form, uh, when, when you're spreading it on top of it, on crops, 
uh, as long as the, uh, the residue is there, insects can't eat it. It contains a protein that perforates the stomach of the bollworm. And if that happens, then the insect either gets sick or it dies, so they, they can't survive. Well, what Monsanto did with that uh, concept was they figured out, hey, wait a second, we can take that gene that expresses for the protein that the insect can't eat, and we can place it into the genome of corn. And we can make it so that that, or, or, or of cotton, uh, we can make it so that cotton produces that protein that is selective only for insects. So it's, it's a rather um, ingenious solution, both as a topical solution, as an insecticide, and as a genetically engineered one, because it, it's, it is no harm to human beings. It doesn't operate on the same system that we do, but it does kill the insects. This over here, this is uh, corn, but in between this corn is a plant called palmer amaranth, sometimes called palmer pigweed. If, um, if I am showing this presentation or presentation similar to it to a group of farmers, when that slide comes up, you will literally hear a groan in the room. It is one that they are very, very intimidated by because the plant grows to be 8 to 10 feet tall, and it has over a million seeds on it. And once it is over about 2 and a half feet tall, those million seeds are viable. It's trying to grow and outpace and grab as many photons from these different corn plants as they can. Their, their strategy is to come over top and they'll shade out the different corn and they grow up in between the rows. And so it's a very, very uh, vicious weed. Now, in the, in the past, the way that you could get rid of something like this would be to literally send people out into the fields and to cut weeds out or to pull them. And in that village that I was living in, in Kihungwini, in Kenya, that is what people spent about eight to 12 hours a day. They would be bent over all day long pulling weeds out of the ground. And that would literally be their existence for the entirety of their lives. There are young girls that grow up, and by the time they're about five years old, for the rest of their lives, when they're married, after they've had children, even when they're grandparents, that is how they will spend their time, is pulling weeds. Another option that we have for something like weeds are to be able to use, again, chemistry. So we can use things like You've probably all heard of Roundup, which is an herbicide. So it, is, um, it, it, it goes out and kills basically any of the uh, plants that it comes in contact with. Um, there are all sorts of different types of herbicides. You can have ones that only operate on grasses and, uh, and ones that only operate on broadleaves. Now that's an interesting solution because if you have something like a soybean, which is a broadleaf, and you have grasses growing in it, you can go and spray a, a, an herbicide over it that only selects for grasses, and it, you can spray it right over top of it, and it doesn't kill the broadleaf soybean, it just kills the grasses there that are competing for the nutrition. We can talk more about things like Roundup, um, but when you hear GMOs in terms of herbicides, one of the strategies that Monsanto came up with very early was to be able to take a gene and place it into a plant like corn and say, when, you are to, when glyphosate touches you, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, don't stop the photosynthetic process. Because glyphosate, the way that it operates, is it essentially tells the weed, stop growing. Stop going through the photosynthetic process. Stop converting uh, uh, solar energy into food. And when we created an alternate pathway by creating this GMO in corn, we meant that you could take this relatively benign herbicide in, in terms of its toxicity level, and one that had broad applications, it would kill a lot of things and make it so you could spray over top of it and, it and it wouldn't kill your crops. This down over here, this is a fusarium wilt, I believe, but one of the other ones that maybe people here might be a little more familiar with would be things like blight or rust. So we imagine things like uh, potato blight, where you have um, a, a sickness, a disease that can spread through a, a field, uh, actually through you know, hundreds of fields and kill the entire crop, make it not viable. So some of the solutions that we have for those, we now have, um, we certainly have chemical solutions to be able to place over top of them, uh, particularly in places like Florida, there's a whole lot of research coming out of these tropical environments where you can use either uh, different types of fungicides 
or you can start using RNAi solutions, or there are GMO solutions that you can add in a trait that allows the plant to be able to resist that sort of blight. So you can do this either with um, the genetic engineering that we were talking about before, or there's a great deal of hope for being able to do it with gene editing, where you go out and find a wild relative or a relative that is very far away, and instead of trying to breed them together to be able to have this trait to resist the fungus, you can now just take that trait, use a viral package, and drop it into the plant so that that way it resists that type of blight. And then down here, clearly everybody is aware of drought, but oftentimes we don't think of it in terms of drought is not necessarily the complete absence of water. Oftentimes for a farmer, it's not getting water at the right time. So different crops grow at different rates or at different times during this, the season. So in something like corn, if you can help, we have a project called WEMA, Water Efficient Maize in Africa, where we've worked with the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Howard Buffett Foundation to say, can we help corn grow, and when it becomes a dry season, have that plant constrict how much water it's using for just a little while without all of their leaves wilting, and then when water comes back, they open back up and start processing food. So these are genetically engineered solutions to problems that in the past we, never, we didn't think we'd be able to solve, where you have these wild variations in when rain comes. So... As I uh, end here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up uh, with just one more slide, and then we can go maybe take, a, take a, a break and get some beers. But one of the things that I find the most interesting about crops and about genetic engineering and about the conversation that's been going on about um, uh, Monsanto's intentions, things like that, is when I came in to find out just how absolutely magnificent our breeding program is. Most people think about Monsanto and they, they immediately uh, equate it with GMOs. But in fact, most of our budget is on breeding. It's figuring out what are the two parental lines that we can bring together, or what are seven parental lines that if we bring them together over a long period of time, we'll be able to solve problems. Oftentimes there's this idea of monocrops that gets put out there. They say, Monsanto, you are just helping farmers grow one crop, and that's all that it is, and it's really, really dangerous because one thing could come through and wipe it all out. And I think on its surface, that seems to make a lot of sense until you see something like this. I wish this had shown up a little bit better, but this is what this data scientist at Monsanto, Tim Williamson, Tim Willett on Twitter, said is the corn galaxy. Each one of these dots represents a different inbred line inside of our um, a library of genes that, that we have access to, different breeds. And each line in between those that are swirling around represent different traits that we have crossed over with other seeds, with other breeds, and with other inbred lines. Meaning that we've been able to take the very best traits from six continents around the world where we're trying all different types of um, plants that we're growing up, completely absent of GMO solutions, to be able to solve very complicated problems. It's only after we've selected one of those parents that then you add in the GMO. And the only reason I bring that up is because I think oftentimes a, a, a discussion that is actually a very complex one that includes things like breeding is often vastly oversimplified to should we make the binary choice between GMOs or not because it's actually a much more complex and really kind of robust, interesting discussion if we can talk about all of the options, including uh, data and um, breeding and different types of chemistry or RNAi solutions. So the only reason I bring this up at the end is when we come back after taking a little bit of a break, I don't know how fast I went or how long I went for, but um, we can discuss any of these things. We can discuss things about breeding, we can talk about Monsanto business practices, we can talk about culture. I'm open to talking about any of these things, but I'm really hopeful that this group will be interested in having kind of this multi-layered approach to how we think about this conversation. So thank you very much for your kind uh, attention, and I'm going to hand it back over to Ms. Brown.
All right, so question and answer time. If I could just ask you to make sure that your questions are questions and not too long. We can, if we can avoid the ethics, that would be wonderful. Um, so, uh, raise hands, please. Yes, somewhere back there, sir. Go ahead. Okay, so to rephrase your question, you can tell me if this is right. If you're using like an herbicide like Roundup and you're doing it over and over again, how do you keep it from having the same thing that we have antibiotic resistance so that these weeds become resistant to the Roundup? Is that your question? Sometimes people call that super weeds. You've heard this term. So the truth of the, of the matter is it is absolutely possible for weeds to develop resistance. And in fact, the reason that I chose Palmer amaranth is its great trick, the reason that it is so scary, is that on that one million seeds, it has a huge amount of genetic variation. Its strategy is don't use one central strategy, try all different kinds of things to see if you can have the one random mutation that gives you glyphosate resistance. And there have been glyphosate resistant uh, uh, Palmer Amaranth. Now, the interesting thing about Roundup is that it's been on the market for over 40 years, and there are really only a couple of weeds that have developed a little bit of resistance. And so if you compare that to other herbicides, that's pretty good. Um, because other herbicides are completely retired within less than 40 years. There's a guy named David Zorek, the risk monger that, that gives a lot of talks over in the EU. He talks a lot about the efficacy of other herbicides. But I think there's even a, a larger um, thought on this is that, remember when I was talking before about how you can send children out into the fields to pull insects off of it? Well, this is a selection pressure. And in evolution, anytime you have a selection pressure, you will have random mutations of the next generation of insects that are gonna try and outcompete that. And what ends up happening is, as a child is walking through the field, or even an adult, they're going to spot the insect that looks the most different from the plant, the easiest one to spot. So they start killing all of those. But if there are any mutations that make that, that insect a little bit more green that matches that particular plant, well then they may not get picked off, and they get to replicate their genes again. So you start seeing resistance, not just in chemistry, but in any strategy that you put out there. So one of the strategies that companies like Monsanto, and we're not the only one, would do for something like Palmer Amaranth is to say, the odds that you can come up with a random mutation to be able to resist Roundup, we can factor that number. There, there, there's statistical ways to be able to choose. It's, there's evolutionary biologists are really applied statisticians. One thing that you can do is to make that the odds far less is by saying, if you could both be resistant to Roundup and Dicamba, the odds that that plant will be able to throw off mutations that are, that are both tolerant to Dicamba, which is a different type of herbicide, and Roundup are way lower. So we can double or triple stack those. That comes with it kind of a weird feeling like, are you always going to be in an arms race? And that's why when, um, when I was kind of finishing, I was saying there's multiple tools you can start using things like uh, RNA interference, RNAi is what it's called. You can use uh, different times when you go and interrupt the weeds, but you're always trying to compete with that. So I know that's a long answer to a short question. You never get confused between super weed and super weeds. Right. Um, <laughs> next question. Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Mike. Uh, just to uh, explain my question. I'd like to put a different history of the agricultural technology because I don't agree that um, people left the land because they were free from having to work on it. In Scotland and England, we know how people were driven off the land by uh, 
force in Scotland, we know there are enclosures and clearances, more to be fodder for factories. And after that, there's a long history of unintended consequences, including the most famous one being the Irish potato famine. So I think the uh, question is not really why do people hate or mistrust the technology. It is, you have given other talks on why people hate Monsanto, and I wouldn't agree that it's just Monsanto. It's, people think, a lot of people will think that technology has great potential, but must mistrust how final decisions are taken on which technology is used. And sooner or later, there's a divergence between the technology which makes production cheapest, yields the greatest, and on the other hand, what is beneficial for the consumers of the food and any company. So I, I can only ask how and can you really assure that this is going to be open and transparent decisions like that, uh, which uh, avoiding the unintentional, unintended consequences that have happened in the past. So if I'm hearing your question correctly, you're saying how, if we're going to move forward with new technologies, can you ensure that you're not going to be making mistakes that, that radically alter through force where people live? Is that, is that correct? Or how they and, live? And the food they eat and the, the, the whole ecosystem. I can tell you that's the first time I've ever been asked that. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know that I'm going to have a, a very satisfying answer. The thing that comes to mind um, is about something along the lines of progress, right? Like, how do we know if the world is getting better or easier? And I think that when we look around at the world, we can see that there are lots of things that we don't like about the world, different violence that we see in places or different political activities. but. Um, there's one writer that, right when I took the job, I, I read a great deal of his writing. I, I don't know how familiar you guys are with him, Matt Ridley. Yeah. He wrote a book called The Rational Optimist that had a large impact on yeah. you. And in that book, he, he talks about how, do we, how can we mark if things are getting better in the world? And, and the way that he did this is he said, how much would you have to work right now to earn enough money to have five minutes of reading life? And then compare that with different times in history. So for example, if you were in uh, the 1700s and you were living, uh, the context that I have is in the United States, if you wanted to have five minutes of reading life, it meant that a group of men would have to go together and build a giant wooden ship, huge. And then they would get on this ship and they would sail it out into the North Atlantic where the wildest waves were and they would get into a little tiny rowboat and they would carry harpoons out there and they would go kill a whale, bring it onto the, the rowboat, then bring it onto the ship and then cut it open in order to be able to get that whale oil to then be able to distribute it. In order to be able to buy five minutes worth of reading light, it cost you 3,000 hours of human labor. And so if we think about now, when you go into your job, if you're a person that turns on your computer or you uh, start turning on lights or turning on a stove or whatever, you've earned more money in the amount of time for that stove to get hot or for your computer to turn on than you'll need for five minutes of reading light. Everyone you know could get five minutes of reading light from that. And that's one way to measure progress. And I don't know that that's answering your question, but that's what I thought of when you were speaking. Partly, but uh, the same things that produce the benefits can also produce great disasters. Uh, you know, it's not just a smooth... I, I agree with you. I, and, and I would say that the best reaction to making sure that you don't have disasters happen is you don't choose one solution. You choose many, many solutions. And you empower as many people on as many parts of the world as possible to be able to come up with uh, solutions to very complicated problems. OK. Uh, Trevor, and then we'll come to the two gentlemen there. You mentioned a number of different approaches that Monsanto researchers take uh, to finding solutions for agricultural problems. So my question is, uh, does Monsanto follow, and to what extent is Monsanto interested in, the field of agroecology? And is Monsanto simply responding to the way things are done and what the market is demanding? Or are they also interested in helping create a world that might need less pesticides overall, not just through genetics, but through 
agroecology, basically, is the crux of the question. So, um, with I think everybody heard that question. So, the agroecology is a word that, at least in my mind, has many, many meanings. My younger sister is an agroecologist and does permaculture farming. Um, and I think that in Monsanto's perspective, uh, we are probably catering to certain segments of the market for farmers and we're selling solutions to their problems. But I think that one of the things that we've come to realize over time is if somebody on the, just like the skeptics, right? The skeptics are on the edges where you're testing out where are good ideas and where are their bad ideas and how do we know what the difference is, right? This is where new ideas actually end up diffusing into society. We are very open to anyone that is creating new solutions, trying out new and different things to be able to say, is that something that we can apply on this large scale within the system that, that we are really built for? But I wouldn't want to, to imply that we are agroecologists because that's not a term or a concept that is, is used within the company. Uh, go ahead, sir. Big will come to you next. Okay. Yep. Go. Um, people who are critical of the use of uh, genetic modification you know, would suggest that um, there are alternatives. You know, for example, you know, you uh, would sort of speak about the, the alternative of the problem being experienced in part of the world of the uh, poverty, etc. You know, and a lot of complicated reasons um, for that. I'd like to use an example you know, of a situation in, in India, for example, you know, where suicides are, are being blamed on the conversion to GM agriculture. Um, how do you respond to that? So you were talking about what about places in like that are in developing countries like India where the there is thought that <laughs> applying GMO technology led to the suicides of farmers, is that correct? So um, that question, Indian farmer suicides, is I think one of the most difficult to talk about because there's no way to be um, gentle about a cultural like tragedy. And, and it's very true that there was a period of time where Indian um, farmers were caught in positions of heavy debt and they were taking their own lives. Monsanto's position um, uh, is that we entered a market where there were people that were having to use chemicals. So, so just so we're all on the same page, we're talking about BT cotton and its introduction into India. And Monsanto, when they came into India, they thought, this is fantastic. We are going to be able to help these people limit how much they're using pesticides, specifically insecticides. And in particular, in places like rural and developing India, many of the farmers uh, can't read. So when they are going into a uh, store to be able to buy the chemicals, they just have to trust whoever is there that whatever they're paying for is what they're getting and how to apply it. They didn't know, and there were a lot of problems with that. So they came in and they decided that what they would do is uh, sell the seeds at an incredibly high price so that only a few of the best farmers that already were the most developed could have that technology. But when word spread of what the seeds could do, that you could put them out and you wouldn't have to go out and spray 12, 15, 16 times to be able to compete with those insects, there were people that started replicating the bags and telling people, I'm giving you BT cotton, when in fact they weren't doing it. And so they were paying a higher price and that, that generic brand or the pirated brand was one that was being used. At the same time, there was a whole lot of problems around finance and uh, land subdivision that there's no way I could uh, pro probably give it all due credit, but the company responded by doing several things. One, um, we used to hang bags, seed bags on the wall at the company it's a, it's a proud moment. If you're a part of a team that helped develop a new line, right? You developed, you remember the galaxy here? If you developed a new line or you helped launch it, you would hang these bags up and they would hang them on the wall, almost like, um, you know, awards that I was a part of this thing. All of those things came down. And in fact, they started tracking every single bag that they knew anywhere where it was because a single bag going out 
that somebody could capture and fill with seeds, because you can't tell if there's a GMO in it, uh, were, were dangerous. And then they started working with the Indian government. It turns out that now the government sets a price on those seeds, and uh, everybody pays. There's, you can't sell them uh, at the market rate. It's what the government determines, and several other things. So uh, the, if you go and look at the statistics, they're not different than, say, the suicide rate of farmers in Sweden, for example. But these are really uncomfortable things to talk about, because any time a farmer takes their life, that, that's a serious situation. Yeah, I can just come in there. Um, I I dug some stats out on this, so um, and, and and it makes for depressing reading. Um, you've got thirteen thousand suicides in ninety six, thirteen thousand in ninety seven, sixteen thousand in ninety eight, sixteen thousand in ninety nine, sixteen thousand in two thousand, and so on and so forth. Now, bear in mind, when was it that uh, you went in? Uh, to India? Uh, I think it was about 10 years ago. I don't, I don't remember the exact date. 2002. So these are all numbers I'm giving before there was any Monsanto involvement at all in India. And that's from the NCRB. Now, it spiked, uh, the, well, it was an, up, an upwards trend, and you hit, um, and I think, 17,000, 18,000 in, in 2004. Since then, it's gone down. Gradually, a little spike in 2009, I believe, due to some drought. Um, but the numbers that I dug out, citation required, showed an upwards trend, introduction of business with Monsanto, and it's coming down. It's a problem that was already there, and is already there. And there are some other documents here that talks about the main reasons for suicide. Droughts, one of them, financial burden, family pressures, and, and other things. Um, there's, a, there's an excellent Talking Biotech podcast, which is put on by a, a professor named Kevin Fulta, and they do a two-part series where I learned a whole bunch about the situation that even I didn't know, and I, I never feel, after having listened to two hours of uh, a world expert that studied this, I never feel adequately prepared to answer that question, because it was so complicated. And the, number, the numbers are huge. Bear in mind the population of India, um, but it's shocking numbers. But you know, bearing in mind those numbers were equally as shocking before any GMOs were introduced, um, I think we have to take a very nuanced look at the, at the data. Oh. Uh, were, were they all suicides, or was that just among the farming population? Just among the farming population. Yeah. Um, so, Diggy, we're going to come to you next. Yeah. Uh, what, what have you done about the seemingly irrational, emotional decision of the Scottish Government to ban So I am reluctant, having only been in your country for about 18 hours now, to, uh, I, I can tell you that just from the uh, small ride I had in the countryside that your politics seems complicated, to say the least. But, uh, you know, I think the biggest thing and, um, that I've seen in the last two and a half years is that people are not afraid of GMOs or angry about GMOs for no reason. People came and told them scary things, bad things about them. And so to expect a politician to go and make a rule that is rational when people have had fear spread among them um, and the companies that were most responsible for the technology weren't showing up to talk or do anything about it, you can see this is the logical consequence. And what I have seen over the last two and a half years is a really hopeful thing, which is there was a time when no one would have invited me onto a stage. Nobody. And, and now you're having people say, hey, come talk with us about GMOs. Hey, we're going to go teach scientists, not, not Monsanto, but people are putting on classes for scientists how to talk to the public. They're putting on classes for farmers how to go talk with the public. And so when I think about the Scotland situation, it, is, it starts with a moment like this at the top of the wave, and, it, and then it moves on so that when you're at a party and you interrupt and say, well, actually... Let me, let me tell you what I know about that. Yeah, good luck with that one. Uh, okay, I, <laughs> was that the Scottish politics comment or what? <laughs> okay, uh, gentlemen over in the corner there. Um, a lot of the, one of the main stories I heard about um, when people were demonising Monsanto was the, the whole kill switch in the genes thing where they could sell seeds that didn't germinate after one, mm -hmm. one year. Um, and I think after reading a bit about it, what I found out was they own the technology, but they promised not to use it. So 
So how much do you know about your company? Um, if you thought there was ever that was ever going to be implemented, who would make that decision? So you think it would be scientists or would it be a corporate thing? So terminator seats. Is that so he, it yeah. essentially is. So actually, this, that's a great. So what he's saying is. Did you, I, I've read about your company and I've heard that you have this technology that makes it so the seed does not produce offspring the next year. And they call it the Terminator seed. So it's saying, uh, you know, it, you could grow it this year, but the seeds that it grows on cotton, so when you grow cotton, there's little seeds on the top of it, that then it wouldn't grow. You know, there's a really interesting irony here and that Monsanto bought that um, technology from Delta and Pine yeah. and actually it had never been developed they put forward what was called a prophetic patent, where it was saying, like, we believe that we can do it by doing these things. And Monsanto, when they bought the company, heard the public outcry or kind of knew what they were kind of heard and said, we're not going to develop it. But I actually think, I've heard scientists talk about, it's actually kind of a shame, particularly if you're talking about people being deeply concerned about things like GMOs escaping into the wild or you have certain types of, trials that you're putting out there because what it would mean is if you use that technology which has not been developed and we have no intention of developing it but if you did have that technology you would not have to worry about um, seeds uh, blowing off into the wind and then propagating out into the wild that problem would be solved so it, it's uh, it was unfortunately named by some activists the terminator seeds um, but I think that it has some some pros and I don't think there's a ton of cons with it um, gentlemen at the back. Chairman, I see that question the other way around. Why wouldn't you uh, develop the Terminator seed because there's huge intellectual property problems with seeds from one farm ending up in another farm and then there's been cases of Monsanto going after the farmer that ended up with its seeds in their farm through no fault of their own. So uh, what you're talking about is the cross-pollination and the accusation that Monsanto sues farmers that pollen has drifted from one place to another. Um, and so maybe the first elephant in the room is that people have a perception that Monsanto sues thousands of farmers, that we are suing them constantly. And uh, uh, you guys remember when I told you that they made that list up of all the people that I was going to go talk to? And, and like I think I was in week three when I finally got to sit down with the attorneys and I like pull out my notebook and I'm like, all right, tell me why you guys sued all those farmers. And I you know, was really ready for them to say, well, you know, the first 300, we sued them for this reason and the first, you know, the next 400. It turns out over the 12 years that um, we've, we've had, or 16 years that we've had um, biotech lawsuits, there's only been 54 cases ever. None of them have ever been for cross-pollination. And we've even gone before the Supreme Court and said, we will not sue someone for accidental cross-contamination. There were, however, some farmers that were violating their contracts and claiming that it was cross-pollination. But maybe the best way to make this seem, uh, the best way to understand this or to be able to see the larger picture, when we developed BT cotton, um, it took us, many, many years to be able to get that gene from the, the insecticide and put it into cotton. And then from there, we had to go through about 13 years of regulation. And each one of those years cost $10 million. So those seeds, in addition to all of the R&D costs, now have $130 million of R&D. But the thing about cotton is it is not a hybrid. You can take the seeds from your cotton and you can replant them and you could grow up that same plant with that same trait in it. So we went to the farmers and we said, we are going to have to recoup the entire R&D budget and all of the regulatory costs in the first bag of seeds. And those farmers got together in a, in a meeting with uh, Monsanto people, but also industry representatives and other farmers. And they said, no, 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 no. I'll have to mortgage my house, and my farm in order to be able to buy those seeds. Isn't there another way? So collectively, they came up with a strategy where Monsanto made an agreement that they would not make the farmers pay for all of the R&D and all of the regulatory in that one bag. That what they would do is instead spread that cost out over, over several years, and the farmers could choose every year if they wanted to rebuy it, but Monsanto would not substantially raise the price any one year. But in, in order for them to do that, they asked the farmers, well then you can't take these seeds 
and replant them, that won't be fair. And the farmer said, okay, I agree with that. I will make the choice every year whether or not to repurchase. But if I sign an agreement that says I won't replant your seeds, then you, Monsanto, have to make an agreement with me. Because these seeds are expensive. Let's just imagine a $50,000 bag of seeds, right? If, if, if I am going to agree that I will not save my seeds, but my neighbor is saving seeds, then he's saving $50,000 for every bag that he's not purchasing, which means he can go out and buy more land than me. He can go out and buy bigger equipment. He can grow faster than I can, which causes a bunch of problems. And so they had the agreement that if somebody cheated on their contracts, that Monsanto would sue them. So we, in an effort to be equitable to the farmers that are following the rules, have agreed to have to, to sue farmers that have broken those rules. And it happened in the beginning when there was a big transformation, but it very rarely happens now. Okay, uh, I was gonna go here. So um, to, to begin your question, there is no doubt that the price per calorie that has been made accessible to human beings has gone down incredibly, right? As we have increased production, now people that used to not have access to any calories or very, very few calories now have a prolific amount. And then oftentimes they're put in processed foods. And those processed foods are valuable to people that don't have very much money because they're very stable, right? So you can have a bag of chips or things in the center of the grocery that are, um, that, that are able to last for a long time so your dollar goes a long way. Monsanto really recognizes that. But if you go look at where do our products go, about only about, I think it's between 7 and 9% of our products go into processed foods like that. The rest of our products are sold essentially for feed for cows or for milk, uh, for, for two cows that end up becoming milk, or then ultimately to eggs, that, that sort of protein. We sell a lot to, okay. So we have uh, two registered dietitians just in uh, one building that I'm in that work on what are, what are it has, at its core, it's what is being sold at the grocery store, right? If, if we started a campaign to go tell people what to eat, if you think they don't like us now, <laughs> 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 Team up with McDonald's? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 but go on, go on. I, I understand. I was just wondering if uh, there was any effort made by Monsanto to dissociate completely from it and just like give out the science to. No, uh, so, so um, when the company made some pretty big decisions that we were no longer going to just focus on our farmers and just focus on our investors, we uh, hired registered dietitians to say, hey, how is this impacting the wider world? How should we understand what's going on in people's lives and how they get their food and how can we make an impact on that? But I won't make the claim that we are trying to go out and change consumer behavior because we're not. Okay. Uh, I'll come to you next, Chris. Uh, just over in the corner there, yeah? Um, so I have a, a question about mainly the intellectual property issue because I think, like you said, there, there are a lot of varieties in place, but actually most of them they exist but they are not grown like the grown varieties are much more similar to a monoculture globally than they are to this complex beautiful variety so <coughs> in the midterm or even long term if there's only one or a few varieties that are uh, sold and grown and all of them are property of Monsanto 
and even the ones that are not grown are also property of Monsanto because they've been developed in the labs. There comes a point when only one company has practically a monopoly on the whole market of global food. How's that? And obviously it's in the interest of the company to, to have that because they would make all the profit. How could you prevent that from happening? So I think that the question you're asking, was everybody able to hear that? It, it essentially came down to if, if uh, you own a huge volume of the germplasm, the seeds of the world, and whether they're being grown or not, you decide we're not going to sell them, we're going to just continue to control them, then doesn't that make you a rather dangerous company to become so big and so powerful? Is that fair? Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the first thing that I would say is the activists have done an excellent job of painting Monsanto as being this uber-powerful company. And a, a, as evidenced by, like, I'm just a guy that showed up from an ag company, and there's a whole bunch of people here that are like, I want to I talk to this guy from Monsanto. Most people, and I, if I go to a college campus and I say, how many other major seed companies there are there? They have no idea. They have no idea that there are five other major seed companies, and some of them are in Europe. China just entered the, the game by um, purchasing Syngenta. And so there, are, there is much competition on the big level, and on things like vegetables and uh, rice and other uh, crops that we're not in, there's far more competitors. And I think the, the thing that really crystallizes this for people is if you were to imagine what percentage of the seed, the global seed that Monsanto owns, what, what percentage would you guess? Oh, the audience can share it as well if you want to guess. It depends, depends whether you are talking about every crop. Different germplasm line. For example, major cereal about, crops. Okay. Um, I guess maybe 20%? 5? 5%. Yeah. So, and, and that does not include, I mean, we are only in a small subset of cereal crops, you know, the ones that are major, and then we're in uh, some vegetables, but mostly the vegetables that are kind of globally eaten, um, but not many of like the local varieties or things that are, that are more indigenous. They, we just, as a large company, we don't enter small skews, they call them. Okay, uh, Chris? I'd like to ask you about microcephaly and the Zika virus. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Yes. The, last year, there were articles going around. That was around. the last time we showed up in natural news. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there were articles going around uh, saying that the, the microcephaly outbreak in South America was nothing to do with, uh, with the Zika virus. It was, it was caused by Mon Monsanto's um, pesticides. And those articles have gone silent now. Uh, and A, were you involved as uh, part of that sort of PR response or non-response? And B... What do you do now? Do, you, don't want, you don't want to sort of, sort of be nasty to people, but showing up, you were wrong about this, you shared this article, you are wrong. How, to, to what extent does, does, should one sort of go down that route? So his question, did everybody hear that? About did, did Monsanto cause microcephaly? <laughs> does it appear as though you did? So if you didn't, then we saw that thing rise and then drop. Were you a part of that drop? And then do you want to go back and kind of point out the, the people that, that did that? Yeah. Okay. I'm sure we want to, right? That, that would be, I know there are people, but um, so to answer your question, first of all, what the claim was, was there was a small number of activist groups, uh, Mike Adams among them, that was saying things like, it is not a mosquito carrying the Zika virus that's giving microcephaly, it's this pesticide that is sold by another company that Monsanto doesn't own but has a partnership with. So he was drawing these like weird conspiracy diagrams, but it was shared. And at first we saw that spike. And do you know what I think cut that off was uh, two networks or tribes of people. And one was the Skeptics Tribe. We saw them come back and hit that really, really hard. You could watch it. Um, they, they found a lot of joy and fun in mocking and deriding it. And like, that's really important. And the other one is a growing group of scientists that have decided that science communication is deeply important. So there are groups like March Against Myths About Modification that came out and said, 
whoa, 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 whoa. This is, if you conflate it with Monsanto, you're gonna start conflating it with GMOs. If you conflate it with GMOs, you're gonna create laws that block my lab. I don't want that, so I'm gonna go write articles in response to it. We were definitely out talking about it on social media, but I, I, I think it was much more these other tribes of people that were, that got it shot down. And they should feel great and go deride and mock the people that shared it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll come back to my little corner in a second. <laughs> no? All right, you're on well, go for it. Uh, so, GMO labeling, yes or no, is that a good thing? What are the pros and cons? So, he asked, GMO labeling, good thing or bad thing? So, um, the reason that GMO labeling is kind of a disingenuous thing is that, remember when we talked about mutagenesis? You can grow a ruby red grapefruit and label it organic, right? There are a lot of crops that were grown by wildly throwing mutations into that genome. It's in both conventional and organic. So first of all, there are some people that were kind of propagating, hey, we should label these things that I would say are maybe a little bit disingenuous. But the second thing is, if you look at the way this law that was being done in a place like Vermont, so in the United States, when the labeling situation happened, there was one state that got it approved. And this was going to cause all of the manufacturers for people that were doing things in the center of the store that we were talking about before to say, I'm going to have to label this because if a, van if a truck driver has my non-labeled granola bars and he drives into Vermont and drops off the wrong pallet with them, I could be sued. And those lawsuits were, a th I, I believe, I, you'll have to check this, it was like $1,000 per item per day. So imagine if you drop off a crate of food and started selling it, it would be thousands of dollars. So what they were doing was in effect raising the risk of not labeling so that these companies would then go label everything. But when they went to get this law passed, interestingly, um, you can tell I don't like the labeling law. I'm not, not a big fan of it. Um, but uh, when they went to do it, they had to get the right political coalition together. And so the way that they did it was they said, Foods that are sold in certain kinds of packages will have to be labeled, but not other ones. So for example, if you're at a deli and you make a sandwich and you put some, we'll just say canola oil on that sandwich or it's in the bread, you wrap up that sandwich and you sell it right then, no label. If you then made that sandwich and, oh, God, the guy you know, took off or you're making them ahead of time and you set them in the freezer and the next morning you set them in your refrigerator case, now they have to be labeled. So they were making deals with the restaurant industry to get them to go along with it so that that way they could make these weird wobbles in the law. And it was not actually to protect people, it was to scare them. It was to say, hey, these things are labeled, something must be wrong with them. So when Monsanto came in, they said, look, if you're going to label, we, we're not trying to thwart the will of the people. If they want it labeled, fine. But what we're going to do is create a national standard where you don't have the sandwich that's in the, that's in the freezer and then the refrigerator has to be labeled. Like, we need to knock that off and come up with one overarching uh, labeling standard that everybody can get in on board with. So I, I think labeling does not help consumers know anything at all about their food, but if you're gonna do it, make it a level playing field. See, the way, the way I was thinking is if people actually knew what was genetically modified and what wasn't, and then they would, it said why it was genetically modified, you know, because this crop is, getting destroyed by X, would that, could that not be spun off as a positive thing? Or do you think the reaction by the public would be negative and not a sort of, oh, this is why? I think we're gonna watch the free market answer that question. Because there are products like Soylent that are out there that, are, that, that when they ran their ads to get paid attention to all over San Francisco, their ad was just a white board that said, made with GMOs. And people were like, what is this? You know, like, I'm gonna go find out about this. And they have then since really been stood behind it. You also have things like the Arctic apple, which is a non-browning apple. So when you cut it open, uh, it, it, it does not brown in the same way. You'll be able to do it with potatoes. You're gonna find that there are certain companies that are gonna say, you want the trait that's in here. So I think that we'll watch the free market do that. But I don't know, that's my guess on what consumers will want. Go ahead. Yep. So you mentioned organic farming a couple of times. I was just wondering what's your take on it. Is it a genuine effort to make farming better or has it been kind of misled some ideas about farming in general? 
So, as I keep coming back to, I believe that the edges of any movement are really important, right? It's where new ideas can be born. Um, and so, in many ways, if you lock people into an arbitrary standard, so the, the rules on what is allowed in organic, and organic, many people believe it's these have pesticides and these don't, the organic don't, but they don't. They have over 3,000 pesticides can be used in an organic garden, in, in farming. And so it's a matter of like where was the line drawn. But there's a value in that, right? If you put people in an, in an arbitrary circumstance and you say you have to create more using only these things, they're going to come up with innovative solutions. So it is possible for interesting things to come out of that. The thing that I, uh, I struggle with about organic is that many people are buying it because they have been made to feel afraid that the other one is dangerous. And that's no good, right? That's a thing that, you know, you can't really allow quarter for, for an idea that says, buy these products because these other ones will cause cancer. Now, not all organic farmers are saying that, not all organic retailers are saying that, but some of them are. And it's very difficult for a company like Monsanto to call those bad actors out and, and say, hey, if you're doing this because you want to have a new system or you want to try out new ideas, that's great. But don't malign all these other people's good work for, 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 your, for you to make a buck. Okay, so, yeah, we, I mean, we did get asked for a citation on Facebook when we mentioned that organic farming uses pesticides as well. Uh, it, it seems to be a, a common misconception. But taking into account that um, organic farming does require the use of pesticides in many cases, uh, and, and let's lay, lay it in comparison to, to Roundup, if we're talking about toxicity and um, impact on the environment, how do those two weigh up? So I think that you could make a pretty strong case for things like GMOs um, having some of the unintended consequences that people were not imagining that are actually really impactful. For example, on this corn here, Right? You can go and spray Roundup in it. And in fact, you can go spray Roundup at the end of a season or in the spring for all of those weeds that are there. And you can kill all those weeds and you can plant right into them. Because when you're going to plant, it's going to be safe for, for the seeds. It's, it's a very low toxicity. You can't use Roundup in, uh, in organic. The alternative to using something like Roundup, so you have no-till agriculture, is that you use tillage. Which, um, if you're not familiar with tillage, is a large spike that you drive through the ground in order to be able to crack open the soil, rip apart weeds, uh, the root systems that are in there, and disrupt it as much as possible. Because what happens when you do that is you throw huge volumes of carbon up in the air. So if you're having to use this tilling system, you're now throwing carbon up in the air, and if you let that tilled soil sit through the winter, all the snow and the rain, instead of it being one compact, thing, which you get from no-till agriculture ground, now that soil can run off. And you have huge amounts of runoff and soil erosion that come from the fact that you're not able to use some of the newest and best technology, things like Roundup. So, the, you know, I can't make the one-to-one, I won't make the one-to-one -one comparison, but I think that you can make the case that modern agriculture is doing some pretty amazing things for sustainability. All right, okay. And I I'll get back to you in a minute. My, my ball, my game, all right? Let, let's, can, can you talk a little bit about the, the relatively recent um, uh, discussion about glyphosate being a carcinogen? So you're referring to the IARC, right? So the International Regulatory Agency on Cancer. This is uh, an interesting group that is a part of the World Health Organization. They were a freestanding body, and then they came under the World Health Organization and they're, they've been around since the 1970s, and they have um, they purport to say, we will tell you what causes cancer for things that are not ordinarily regulated. So things like, you know, we've had hairdressers for, uh, uh, um, hair dryers for a long time. Do they cause cancer? Or does working the night shift cause cancer? So initially, they were putting out to say, we're going to check the things that people don't look for. But when they came across glyphosate, and they decided to put it on the, the, the docket that they were going to go check it out, this was absurd because they have no reason to look at it because there are so many agencies that have looked at this and said glyphosate does not cause cancer. It was the EPA, the different European organizations. 
so many studies at public universities, at different um, industries. In fact, if other companies could prove that something like glyphosate caused cancer, they would do it right away, right? Because there are competitors, but it's not. It's very, very safe. So IARC came out with this very weird ruling um, that was, it is probably carcinogenic. And if you go watch Miles Powers and James Gurney do an excellent episode going through that IARC uh, paper, but one of the things that they do is they study thoroughly debunked, uh, like, Seralini rats Seralini studies. Study. Yeah, yeah. And so they're using studies that the rest of the scientific body does, would not accept as acceptable, and they're putting it out there. And this has real-world real, co real world consequences, because then you have people going out and saying, the WHO said this causes cancer, when no other body does, and it's not actually the WHO, it's the small body inside of it. And then the second thing that does is it automatically triggers in the state of California that that has to be labeled as knowingly causing carcinogen, and, and, it, and it's just not true. So we believe that that was a, a body of people that came together with uh, an agenda to, to put it forward, the idea that it was causing cancer, and it causes a lot of fear, right? Okay, excellent. All right, back to you guys. Now you can have your turn, right? Um, go on, Tom. A, a sort of follow-up question, you're talking about the, uh, the funding of uh, the research and development through the pricing on the seeds. Is that regulated in a similar way to medicines and that you have a patent for a certain period that then expires and people can produce generic versions? Or is it entirely voluntarily regulated through your agreements with the farmers? In which case, is there a horizon on when that pricing goes down? So if I'm understanding, you're saying in, in things like if you patent a trait to go into soybeans, for example, Roundup Ready soybeans, does that come off patent or do we have some agreement to make it cheaper over time? The answer is yes, it comes off patent. So um, th there are right now uh, seeds being produced by the University of Arkansas that are Roundup Ready 1, the first version of Roundup Ready that we put out, that are now available for public use and for other people to breed out the, the, the seeds with, traits, with that trait in it. Um, and that's kind of the effect of the patents. It's also why uh, the patent regulatory system is so complicated and actually kind of prevents in many ways competition. Because if it takes you 13 years and $10 million per year, $130 million, there are only a handful of companies in the world that can afford to get through that regulatory system. And many of those regulations are built on fear that we were talking about before, politicians responding to people's fear. And so instead of it being, what does the science tell us we need to regulate, it says, well, we should, uh, we should just keep adding more time on, which means less people can get through that regulatory process, and it's longer until those things come off patent. Excellent. Okay. Now, we've, we've hit half nine, which was usually when we stop, but this is too interesting to stop. If you guys don't mind, we can go on our five minutes. Vance, are you good with that? Yeah, that's that's fine. Right, we'll only get it chucked out anything. Go ahead, bye. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, the situation with uh, the deer merger. Um, I mean, the what? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, for the first time, in a, in a very unexpected way, we had um, previously tried to uh, purchase one of our competitors. It didn't work out. And Bear came along and said, actually, Monsanto, we think we would make a really good partnership. And uh, I, I think, actually, this is, it, it kind of bears out an interesting conversation. Quite a while ago, um, it used to be that seed companies were here and genetics companies were over here, right? They were really different, particularly when you talk about traits. So then Monsanto, kind of one of the ways that they became a competitor in this space was they said, let's bring these two things together. Let's have geneticists that are working on traits and seeds in the same company, so that way we can line them up better. With Bayer having a, a more pronounced portfolio of chemistry, as opposed to our, we have a larger uh, germplasm, more seeds, um, then, uh, then what we're saying now is, if we bring uh, seeds, traits, and now the chemistry that will go with them, so that way you can do those double stacked traits, so you can outcompete something like Palmer Amaranth, we'll be able to get things to market faster because if you're, if you're developing them separately, you're doing a trait that takes 13 years to get all the way through regulatory and a chemical that may take 20 years to get all the way through. And if you stack those on top of each other, you're talking about potentially 33 years 
before you get a solution to a problem that a farmer has, which means you're gonna see a lot more um, weeds out competing the, thing, the options that we have. So I think that there's a great deal of potential in this, but the deal won't close until the, probably the end of 2017. Excellent. Um, Jamie, go ahead. Uh, can I raise the subject of Frankenstein food? Uh, specifically... Frankenstein food. <laughs> well, I know this is not food we're talking cotton here. It seems like quite strange. I mean, we understand why it was done and you explained it well. Taking something from a, a bug in the soil and putting it into a plant. Have scientists within Monsanto given appropriate consideration to the possibility of that gene once it's in a plant spreading to other plants and having ecological consequences? So that, that's an excellent question. Um, the, uh, the, the trait that is in that cotton, it took many, 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 many times to get it into the exact right place so that the pro not, not just can you get it in there, because it has to be, you know, if you think of a chromosome as a book, uh, you know, and having all those chapters, it has to be in just the right sentence, right? So the odds of it are very low, but as we talked about, you know, anything is possible when it comes to nature being able to evolve out. But I think that the, the, uh, the general consensus on it being able to jump from the cotton species to something else out in the wild, you know, if, if you were talking about two cotton plants next to one another, that would be one thing. But if you're talking about cotton to trees or cotton to grasses, it, the, the breeding just doesn't work that way. The pollen doesn't cross in that same way. In other words, they, they don't think it's going to happen ever at any time in the future. Well, in science, uh, so when I first started with the company, they paired me with the scientist. And any time I gave a yes or no answer, he would be like, ah, science doesn't know anything to the yes or no. But I think the likelihood of it is of a very, very, very small amount. So it's worth the risk. I think that if we look at how much uh, the toxic uh, pesticides were being used in a place like India, or in, even in southern United States, right? It used to be that they were flipping on a tractor, which is gigantic, right? And pulling behind it a sprayer, which means all that diesel engine driving back and forth 12 times an entire year, right? That, that has consequences, and you're putting sprays out there, you're compressing the soil. There are consequences to using this solution, there may be consequences to doing this solution, but it's always going to be about trade-offs, and there's no absolutes, but you get it as close as you can. Okay. Um, let's take one more question, so make it a good one, sir, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, right, basically, um, I think a lot of people realize that the scientific consensus agrees that um, you know, there isn't a real like, uh, threat to human health by consuming uh, you know, genetically modified foods, and the threat to the pesticides and uh, uh, herbicides to humans as well is like minimal at the most but it has been shown that these uh, chemicals in this uh, technology it does affect like the wildlife and can also have like you know ecological uh, consequences such as like loss of biodiversity for instance like uh, the monarch uh, but uh, butterfly in america has been like declining rapidly and that's been linked in like peer reviewed journals showing that it's to do with like the use of roundup and how that kills the butterflies uh, food source. Does Monsanto have any plans to like ameliorate that or to somehow prevent that or compensate the people who might like to see butterflies? <laughs> so the the it's interesting that you bring up the monarch butterfly because yeah. if you go and I'm sure it's on my mother's Facebook page somewhere, me in the second grade wearing my monarch butterfly wings that I colored myself <laughs> and the milkweed that I got the jar. So in, in the United States, the culture of the monarch butterfly is vibrant. It is something that they really care about. And uh, so when you think about the threat to, to a species like that, people take it very seriously. And you're correct. Uh, monarch butterflies only uh, lay eggs on milkweed. Mm. Uh, the, the, maybe the detail that I would change on the way that you describe that is I don't think they've linked it necessarily to Monsanto's Roundup other than the fact that Monsanto's Roundup is really good at killing weeds, and milkweed is a really noxious weed. So if you are trying to grow a crop, and you are able to use a chemical that's able to kill those weeds very easily, you're gonna do that, because I used to go out and walk beans, I would cut out weeds out of fields, and milkweeds would be everywhere. Monsanto recognized that because we were so efficient and because Roundup was so good and made it so much easier for farmers to compete with milkweed, 
that when the monarch population started to decline, they started working with uh, um, the National Wildlife Foundation and started trying to build monarch habitats all around to be able to make the migration pattern. So the cool thing about monarchs is that they migrate all the way down from Canada, all the way down to Mexico in three generations. We don't really know how when one is born that knows to just keep moving, but they do. So we have gone out and distributed milkweed seeds, so we're kind of doing the opposite of our business by spreading these weeds, but also helping to make donations to the large parks and preserves. But at its core, agriculture competes with nature, and so it is a balance that we all have to try and figure out what do we use the land for growing the food, fiber, and fuel that we need, and what is the land that we preserve for the environment. And I mean, I think it's a fair question to be asked. And a good point to finish tonight. So can I have a round of applause again, please? For that. <laughs> All right. So again, for the, for the first timers, usually when we finish up, we go upstairs for a cheeky pint and a chin wag and uh, dissect what we've talked about before. So you're more than welcome to do that. Again, if you could take your empties upstairs, we'd really appreciate it.